everyone. I'm Laure Claire Reyes, Platform Leaders Co-Chair and uh, CEO of Long Trucks, and I'm delighted to welcome you today for this new edition of Platform Leaders. We've got a fantastic program for you. So today we're going to talk about Web3, platform design, and scaling sustainable platforms. I mean, as you may know, Platform Leaders brings together the different communities that are building the future of digital platforms, and that includes practitioners, policymakers, academics, and investors. So once again today, we are collaborating with Louise Plantin, the talented illustrator. So she will be capturing our speakers in action during the webinar, and will show you her progress. Everything today is happening live. So you can interact and submit your questions, comments, reactions through the chat, and the team will do their best to service them at the relevant time. And so I'm looking at um, where people are joining from, and actually for me, I'm joining from the UK and uh, London. <laughs> so um, let's move on to what we've got in store today. So we've got three sessions, and then Benoit Renier, which is a platform co-chair and my partner in crime, <laughs> will close the event. So we'll first start with a fire search fireside chat on Web3 with Frédéric Montagnon, who's the co-founder and chairman of the NFT platform Ariane. Frédéric will talk about his vision for Web3. We also have a panel on designing user-centric platforms with renowned experts from Alphabet, Columbia Business School, the Competition Market Authority, and the Behavioral Insights team. And finally, we'll focus on the circular economy with a discussion on scaling sustainable platforms. We'll hear from Too Good To Go, the leading platform fighting food waste, Refurbed, the fast growing marketplace in Europe for refurbished products, VC firm Bonsai Partners from Spain, and the Innovator publication. But before we start, I'm actually very curious uh, to find out where all of you are working on right now. So we've got uh, a little poll for you. Uh, what describes you best? And um, I'll let you answer now, and we're gonna show the poll in just a few seconds, if that's okay. Now, you can choose one answer or more than one in case you're working on different uh, projects at the same time. Okay, so very interesting. And so we've run this um, survey um, almost at every event, I think, and it's very interesting to see that the, the makeup is actually different from one event to another one. So maybe now if we can see the results, that would be great. Excellent. Very interesting. So I'm looking at the results on another screen and uh, yeah, lots of people actually involved in research or teaching, um, studying the platform economy. We've got you know, practitioners, people thinking about designing, launching or launching platforms, uh, but also people perhaps working for established companies, thinking about uh, deploying or running platforms and a few people working on platform regulation and competition. So that, that's great, um, excellent. So thank you so much everyone for sharing uh, what you're working on. So now let's move to our keynote of the day, uh, which is Web3. And let me introduce you to our keynote speaker, Frédéric Montagnon. Frédéric is a Web3 pioneer. I think we can say that because he's been involved in the field of cryptocurrency as an investor since 2013. Uh, Frédéric is also a serial entrepreneur and investor with more than 20 years of experience. He's founded run and exited four companies for a total value of more than $400 million. His latest venture, Ariani, is a Web3 NFT platform focused on the luxury and fashion industry. And they've raised recently 20 million euros in Series A, led by US investment firm Tiger Global. 
So Frédéric, welcome. Thank you very much for having me and uh, thank you for this uh, warm introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So, um, and thank you for being here with us today. So, um, everyone's talking about Web3, uh, but all like new concepts, there are several definitions around. And so, I'll be really interested if you could share with us your definition of Web3. What, what is it? Yeah, of course, there is no, um, at that stage, there is no real definition of, of Web3 for many reasons. And, and one is, um, uh, it's, there are so much news about, uh, uh, incredible price of uh, NFT trading or uh, about cryptocurrency. There are so much news uh, that are just uh, in the front page talking about the crash of cryptocurrency that we totally forget what is the basics and, and the core values and, and the core reason uh, for this market to, uh, to exist. So first of all, I think from my perspective that the Web3 has begun with the launch of Bitcoin. Um, and by the way, I, I met the, the first communities uh, working about um, around this, uh, this, this uh, cryptocurrency uh, almost 10 years ago. Uh, the reason why I'm mentioning that is uh, I'm an engineer, I'm not a fin financial guy. And what really caught my attention at that time was that those communities were trying to build um, um, a, a distributed governance for an information system. And I think that this is the best way to define uh, what Web3 is about. It's about trying to transform uh, certain level and certain layers of the internet into uh, a common property. Um, so it's about regaining control over the infrastructure as a user and regaining control over our own data. So it's probably not a definition, but I would, I would um, say that Web3 is first of all, even before being a technology or a set of, uh, of uh, architecture, it's a movement. And it's a movement of people who are trying to redesign the really low level of the internet layers and make it um, available for everyone and governed by the users themselves. And of course, we cannot um, not think about how the, the internet works today. We have very few platforms as users that are governing and ruling the internet. And this is, this is the, um, this movement try to rebalance uh, how the, the internet works and make sure that really we gain control over what you use on a daily basis. And what was the spark almost 10 years ago when you thought, well, I think this is going to be big or this is going to have a massive impact. But what was the spark for you uh, that um, inspired you to, um, you know, to invest more time and, and resources uh, in, in that movement? So I think that um, the reason why I was really interested into uh, what they were building is because my former businesses uh, were totally dependent on Google and Facebook strategy and, and, um, and, and yeah, architectures. Um, so I spent probably uh, 10 years as an entrepreneur uh, trying to build system and building systems. But every time that we, we reached um, a certain level, a certain size, uh, we were forced uh, to adjust our strategy depending Facebook or Google strategy. Um, and I see the, the, the platformization of the internet as a real limitation in terms of innovation, in terms of freedom. Uh, so there are many problems around, uh, around data, uh, that data leaking. Um, so we, we all know that um, what are the, the, the bad side of having centralized and hyper centralized uh, platform with a lot of data uh, centralized on just one database. Um, and I saw people who were trying to fix this problem. And, and for me, it's probably the most, the more important problem that we have today uh, in our digital environments. Um, and I saw that if the future of the internet is only two or three platforms defining the rules, defining the business model, and who, who can choose what kind of partner they, they accept, uh, how they filter the content. So, it's, it's just the opposite of the internet as it was uh, designed at the beginning. Um, the, the very first step of the internet uh, were a set of protocol, open source protocol. And the idea, and, and, and probably one of the key factors of success of the internet was 
it's an open network. So you can join the network just plugging a new device and you just be a part of the internet. But after a few years, uh, we see that the platformization of the web has just reversed uh, the spirit of the internet. So um, uh, definitely, I, I was um, uh, seeing how Bitcoin was, was um, designed and, and, and coded. Uh, for me, was one solution uh, of a new era for the internet, uh, a era where we regain control over innovation. Okay, and so as you said, actually Web3 is quite a departure from today's Web2, uh, where the model today, participants give their data in exchange of being matched with another party to enable them to connect and ultimately transact. Um, so in this new world, uh, what will need to happen for the Web3 vision to be realized? You know, what are the missing blocks today uh, that need to be developed? So, yeah, you're right. The, the, the architecture of the internet today is some platforms with centralized database and all the calculation, all the computation happens onto those database. From a technical perspective, that is probably the easiest, easiest way uh, to manage uh, information and to make sure that you can provide to the user uh, a service just because it's easy actually to, uh, to centralize everything, to have in one place, all the data, all the, the software that you need to run a service. Um, and there are, there are all the limits we, we, uh, we just mentioned. Uh, in this new paradigm, uh, the idea is to make sure that every single user has somewhere his own data. And every time he has to transact with someone, every time he has to, to make a connection to someone or to a service, he decides if he wants to plug his data and to reveal part of the data uh, and with, with who and with, with which condition. So what we need today is, is I think, two things. So first of all, is a place to store those data on the user side. It is what we call wallets. Uh, a wallet is, is um, uh, your private key controlling your digital assets. Um, today, we see a lot of progress in this area, uh, but still, it's a little bit complicated for the user to understand how to create a wallet, how to store private keys. And this is probably one of the, um, uh, the, 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 the main opportunity for entrepreneurs to build wallets uh, that fill some needs. So we have now really sophisticated wallets uh, when it comes to storing uh, value and to trading uh, assets. Now we need to have other kind of wallets uh, to be able to store new set of data. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we need to have data and we need to, to have, um, uh, to, to have um, uh, services and, and, and probably brands uh, releasing, issuing um, NFTs as data because in the Web3 um, era, the data is uh, NFT. At the end of the day, you can, uh, I know that NFTs are in, a, in a form. Most of the people are just JPEGs and images uh, sold on the a, on a, on a marketplace, but that's <laughs> yeah. just one application for, for NFT. Yeah. NFT is first of all, a digital components um, that is unique, that can have a serial number, that can contain some information that are just unique. It's data. It can be your edge, it can be your ID, it can be uh, the proof of ownership of something, it can be a proof of attendance. We, we can definitely uh, add for this session an NFT that just represents the fact that today I attended to, uh, to this session. So all these data can be represented as NFTs instead of being a line into a, uh, an entry into the, the database. So we need to have wallets and we need to have more and more businesses and services that use NFTs as a way to issue data and to share that data with a, with a user. So these are the, the, the two main areas uh, where we see now a lot of innovation and big progress. So it's, uh, it's basically, um, and we, we can summarize maybe um, saying that in the Web3 paradigm, your social graph is represented by NFTs. Um, perhaps we, we can take an example today. If, if, I, um, if I see how I use uh, the internet as a, as a medium to, 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 um, to publish content, I can use uh, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Snap, or, or Twitter. On all these different platforms, 
I spent a lot of time as a brand and as a user building my connection to, uh, to other users. But this social graph, my connection, doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the platform. And this is not something that you can extract from the platform and use any, anywhere else. Um, so in the Web3 uh, paradigm, your social graph are just connections that are represented as NFTs that you can, you can create, share with other users. But if you want to use this social graph into different services, different uh, paradigm, you can do it because it is your data. So this is what we mean by saying, regain control over your data. It's not just information that defines you uh, as a human being and, and, and um, kind of information that today are stored into cookies or database, but it's also all the, the social interaction or your, your social graph, interest graph, uh, that you will be able to use as you want and to, and to redesign as you want. Today, you have absolutely no um, possibility to, um, uh, to suppress some data. You, you don't know how, at the end of the day, how the, your, your data and how your social graph is used by your platform. Uh, in the very near future, in the Web3, uh, you will be able to control everything. Okay, so that, that's it. Very interesting. So, you know, so in this new decentralized world where we're shifting from a kind of winner takes most paradigm to winner shares most, uh, what are the implications for the traditional companies? So, you know, companies who are not platforms, how can they, you know, harness uh, the emergence yeah. of new Web3 models? Of course. So today, if you are a brand, you are not a core component on the internet most of the time. So you're just... Uh, at the periphery of uh, some platforms, and you pay those platforms uh, to have a connection with a, with, a, with a customer, with a user. And even if it's already a customer, you will have to pay again and again to be able to reach this customer. Plus, the platform, which is the middleman, will have the choice to redesign the rules all the time and uh, to filter some information to, um, to rank the information on, on just another algorithm. So you are not in possession and you are not in control on the relation and the, and the connection you have with your own customer. Um, for those, those brands, those companies, the opportunity is to have a direct link, a direct connection to a to customer with no middleman. So it's basically a digital sovereignty that we are talking about. Uh, it's just building on the internet something that just belongs to you and where you, you will not have anyone as a middleman uh, interacting with, uh, with your people. Uh, so this is the opportunity. Same thing for service providers. Today, you are a service provider, will probably rely on some existing platform to build on top of this. And you will have to comply, you will have to rely on two existing rules. And of course, uh, the platform will not allow you to, to do whatever you want. So one more time, you will be uh, limited in terms of interaction, limited in terms of innovation. Um, and at the end of the day, it's, of course, an unfair market when you have platforms that just control everything. So for both brands and, and for um, uh, service providers, uh, the, the opportunity is to regain control of all this connection and to make sure that you build something that belongs to you. Okay, so that's great. So we have only a few minutes left and I've got yeah. two, two, three questions to ask you. So um, so what you said is really interesting. So um, could you perhaps give us an example of you know, new business uh, models emerging? I'm thinking about Ariani, mm -hmm. uh, basically you know, the NFT connecting uh, consumers with, with products. Um, has, how does that work and how did you get the idea? And, and why the name Ariani? <laughs> Ariani comes from um, uh, Ariadne uh, in the mythology, in Greek mythology. It's uh, the link uh, that you can create that, that can be uh, here forever. And that it's, um, it's a connection that you, you build with someone that, that will last. Um, the vision we have is we want to help brands and, and service providers to issue NFTs, uh, to put those NFTs into the hand of their users and to interact with those NFTs. So it's a set of open source protocol that we designed. Um, it's everything that a brand needs to enter the Web3 uh, Web era. Um, today, we work mainly with brands. Uh, we started with art luxury, then luxury, fashion, and now really mainstream brands. And um, 
the, 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 the first use case that what we designed was how to represent a real uh, assets that the brand can, can create and, and sell, or how to represent uh, a membership to, uh, to, uh, to, to a community. And with the ability to, um, uh, to issue NFT, uh, you just connect at the end of the day, the real asset you, 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 you build, you, you create, you sell, all the experiences, the services that you provide to your consumer. And you represent the ownership of, or, uh, of this asset or this, um, this service by an NFT. And you make sure that you will have a connection, uh, permanent connection with, uh, with your customer. And you can leverage this connection to create new services that are 100% connected digital, which is something that doesn't exist at the end of the day for, for most of the, of the brands. Uh, let's say you, you, you sell a bag. So a bag will not be connected by design and, and by structure to the internet. With an NFT, you create uh, what we call um, a digital twin, a digital passport uh, that is by nature connected to the internet. So it's a way to, uh, to recreate a connection but it's also, it's also upon the opportunity and, and the doors to many innovation. So uh, there is plenty of, of use case we can talk about. So this is what we do. And at the end of the day, the reason why uh, brands are joining this movement are using such a, a, a protocol such as INE is because they understood that there is a first player advantage to be one of the first brands to issue a lot of NFTs to recreate all the, this connection at first. Yes, uh, so yeah, abso absolutely. Uh, and you have, you know, some uh, leading brands already uh, uh, on the platform. So thank you so much for your insights. I think there's a lot more questions I, I had in <laughs> store. And we have also a very interesting question that came on the chat. Uh, Frédéric, if you want to answer it perhaps afterwards. But just to finish, um, if, um, if you had to encapsulate your vision in a few words and complete the sentence, the future of platforms will be what would it be outdated <laughs> <laughs> and decentralized by the way so it's okay. more um, outdated is a little bit strong but um, but decentralized for sure uh, that solved the problem of ownership that solved the problem of digital sovereignty that solves problem of risk in terms of um, of security of compliance so uh, i don't see any bad side of uh, just decentralizing uh, the way the, the, the data are stored today on the internet. Okay, so thank you so much, Frederick. We've got a question on communities from Peter Evans, so I'll, I'll let it uh, um, reply directly to um, to Peter and, yep. uh, and the community. Um, thank you so much for your insights and, and your passion. I hope your vision will inspire many entrepreneurs to experiment, follow their decentralized mission. <laughs> yeah, if we, they need, everyone needs to use it. Uh, so don't, don't treat that much content about uh, what it's supposed to do. Just play with it and experience yourself. It's very important. Thank you so much, Frederic. Thank you. So we're now going to move to our next panel, uh, Designing User-Centric Platforms. And let me introduce you to our moderator and panel chair, Elizabeth Costa. Elizabeth is the Managing Director of the Behavioral Insights Team UK formerly known as Number 10 Nudge Unit. Uh, Elizabeth's particular expertise is economic policy and digital markets. Joining the team in 2015, um, she has developed and led the team's flagship programs at the intersection of behavioral science and economic policy. She's led dozens of trials and experiments and has also co-authored uh, many papers on consumer decision-making in regulated markets, and behavioral economy and many more. Um, she's currently a senior visiting fellow at the London School of Economics in the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Science. Elizabeth, over to you. We're super happy to have you and I'll let you introduce the other speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, and hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. And welcome to this panel on designing user-centric platforms. I have a fantastic panel here with me today, so I'm hoping we're going to have a really interesting and insightful conversation. 
Um, so I'm going to give a few framing comments about the topic and then I'm going to introduce each of our panel members and ask them to give you a brief overview of their interest in the topic um, and also some initial insights before we dive into discussion. I'm really pleased we're discussing this topic today. In my mind, how we make decisions online is really one of the most interesting frontiers of behavioral science and decision science. And I wanna start by just framing what I think makes online decisions distinct from decisions that we make offline or in our everyday lives. And I think that will guide some of our discussion today. Um, so I think some of the things that set online platforms and environments apart are that firstly, they're highly curated and deliberately designed. And I'm hoping that um, all of our panelists will be able to offer some insights into how that plays out. That gives us the ability to collect vast amounts of data um, and to also actively experiment on what shapes and influences consumer choice and consumer behavior. Um, and also that can also lead to some imbalance between the knowledge of the platform and the knowledge of the user. Uh, and that has the potential uh, to be used for good where platforms can help us to achieve our own goals, to connect better with each other, to learn, it can also be used, I think, for ill, where there can be a misalignment of incentives between platforms and users. And I'm hoping that Andreas in particular can offer some reflections on where the role of the regulator comes in here. But I'm gonna introduce our panelists one by one and then ask them to offer some reflections. Um, so I'm delighted to firstly have Professor Eric Johnson. Eric Johnson is the inaugural holder of the Norman E. Chair of Business, and he is the director of the Centre for Decision Sciences at Columbia Business School. Uh, Eric has a new book out, which is called The Elements of Choice. It's an absolutely fantastic read and an excellent reference for anyone who's interested in how to design effective choice architecture. I'm going to go through all the panellists, and then I'll, I'll invite their comments. Um, Next, we have Dr. Ezra Ozkan, who is the UX lead at Google. Um, Ezra has been at Alphabet for eight and a half years, um, and following her PhD at M MIT, she became a research and product expert, and she has a wealth of experience in translating those insights into vision, strategy, and design, and I'm sure we'll offer many of those valuable insights today. And finally, we have Dr. Andreas Jesperson, who is the Assistant Director of the Behavioural Hub at the UK Competition and Markets Authority. Andreas joined the CMA from the Danish Competition and Consumer Authority, and he's a behavioural science and public policy international expert, and he has a PhD in behavioural public policy from Roskilde University. So, Andreas, I'm going to turn to you first. Um, if you could give us a bit of background about yourself and your role, um, and also how you come, the angle at which you come at this issue of user-centric design on online platforms. Yeah, thanks Liz, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so obviously I work at a regulator, uh, and specifically a regulator that cares a lot about markets. So basically, we care about platforms because they are increasingly what, what is sort of defining markets today. And uh, especially the largest platforms have sort of taken over and grown exponentially, now serve as uh, key instruments in how the market evolves. Um, so this is how we think about platforms. And basically we are trying to sort of uphold the, the basic fundamental law of economics, market economics that we give you money and you give us valuable services and products. And this equation, it needs to be like the, the answer to this equation needs to fall on a positive side. And that's how we think about platforms. That's something that is driving immense value. We are very happy for the uh, evolution of platforms. They're certainly giving consumers in the UK and across the world a lot of value, a lot of indispensable products. We also have a more holistic for, approach to user-centric platforms, I think, because we we not only ask, is this the best platform today, but also is this the be best platform tomorrow and in a year? So we care a lot about stuff uh, that people may not care about when they interact with platforms, sort of like, is, it, is this particular platform 
uh, making it difficult for other market actors to grow, to, for other people to come into the market? Um, is it causing harm to consumers that they can't see? So basically, uh, uh, is a platform's position in the market so that prices are higher than they could be? And this is often incredibly boring in a sense. It's a lot of economic analysis and market uh, evolution and you know how how a platform's growing. But but in the end, uh, I think our role is to think very carefully about often minute details such as consent and active choice and these things and how are options presented on a platform and then think about you know, in the grand scheme of things, what does this mean? What does this mean for users today and tomorrow, and for other market actors coming into the market in ten years? Um, and making sure that as much value as possible is created when we go and buy stuff on these platforms or interact with the platforms, social media, and so on. Um, so basically, when we think about user-centric platforms, I think we think both about is it easy for customers and consumers to engage with the platforms, but also what are the consequences of their actions in a much broader scheme and uh, for other actors in that market? Fantastic, thank you. Ezra, I'm going to turn to you for some opening comments. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I am, uh, as Liz mentioned, I'm a product and research I'm a product and design researcher uh, with expertise in creating human-centered technologies. Uh, my PhD was in a field called science, technology, and society. And uh, since then, I've been really interested in understanding how so technology and society interact and shape each other. Currently, I work as a research lead at Google um, and establishing a specialized research unit called the Choice Lab uh, to focus on how understanding how can our users make decisions and choices and how to design the best solutions to address this. Um, and in general, I think my role has to do with helping create um, products that users love and that can help them achieve their goals and make their lives easier. In terms of um, a couple of insights on user-centric um, user centered platforms, I think often um, our users have a range of options to accomplish a task. Each product has different functionalities, features, and our job as UX professionals is to really figure out how we can present these choices to our users um, within different products. Um, I would say two things that drive that approach is one is contextuality, and that has to do with every time we think about choice, we have to think about it in the context of user needs and goals. So what is the user trying to accomplish and what role does the choice play in that path? Um, and also, um, how can we present choices that are relevant to users' context? And that includes all the way from users' literacy, tech literacy level, languages they speak, maybe devices they use, and even the level of internet connectivity they have. And the second, I think, main principle that we that is at the core of the way we think about design in general, but choice design in, in particular, is an iterative design approach that is data driven. And to ensure that what we think are the right solutions are actually the right solutions, um, because in the abstract, what we think is going to work for users may not work in the end. So an iterative process and uh, a two-way process between design and research, where research informs design, design gets tested, um, and then gets reiterated until we find the optimum solution. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it back to you. Fantastic. Thank you. Eric, over to you. Thanks so much. Uh, I thought I'd start by defining what choice architecture is, since that's not a word everyone knows. It's pretty simple, really. Every time we make a choice, someone has been there before us. We've had a hidden partner who's made a bunch of decisions. Let me give you one kind of fun example, which is a dating site. You go to a dating site and somebody's decided how many dates to show you, what attributes to describe the people on, um, what order to put them in, you know, what size pictures. All those things we know are going to change the dates you have. And that person who you can call a choice architect or a designer is going to influence your life. And that's a definition of choice architecture that I think is sort of interesting because it's important. And we all sort of realize it on one level, but we never think about the choice architect. 
Now, platforms are pretty magical. And that's a good example because you have many more decisions you can make as a designer than you would if you were doing a, a regular physical store. Uh, just to give you a couple examples. One is you can give users control. They can decide to sort. Maybe in our dating site, they could sort by distance away. Um, they can customize. They can decide they want to see some information or the site can customize given the data that the site knows ab about people. And finally, something that's often overlooked is a site can help your comprehension of the options. So for example, when you, I've done a lot of work looking at consumer finance, you know, I can help you understand what uh, a deductible is in health insurance. I can actually play the role of an instructor if I'm a designer. Now I'm a psychologist. I've been studying for many years um, these issues. One example to think about is a default. That is the option that happens if you don't make an active choice. And some of my most famous research is looking at the role of defaults in organ donation. That's been a big issue in much of Europe and obviously in, in the UK. Um, now online, that plays a big role um, and you see it in privacy policies. You see it in retail sites where defaults might be set for shipping and sometimes have hazardly. So these are very powerful tools that I think both consumers often don't realize has an influence on their behavior. So that's an important point. And a second point is sometimes designers don't realize how important it is. I'll end with one very quick story. We did some work for a large German uh, auto manufacturer, upscale cars, and they'd set the defaults for all their choices on their configurator to the cheapest option. Now that was bad for them because people bought cheaper cars, but it's also bad for consumers because if you've ever been on the Autobahn, you know you don't want a small engine if, when someone's passing you at 200 kilometers an hour. So it was basically a lose-lose proposition that was made by not appreciating the effect of design on consumer behavior. I'll turn it back to you after that. I mean, that's a great example and, and a brilliant definition of, of what choice architecture is as a different levers. Um, can I put it back to you, Eric, and then to the other panelists on what makes great user-centered design or great and effective choice architecture? What are the elements of that? So, I mean, I think UX design often em emphasizes a really important point, which is making the experience feel good to the consumer. The second part that comes from sort of the study of judgment and decision making, which is making sure people make the right choice. I could feel great about a choice and it turned out not to be very good. So often there's this tension between choice quality and the experience of making the choice, what I, I think about is fluency, how it, it, easy it is to make the choice and choice quality, how accurate the choice is. So I think that balance is important. And I don't think people actually can tell you what an accurate choice all, is all the time. We, we've heard the word goals and that's true. Goals are there, but goals can be affected by the choice architecture. So it's a little bit more complicated than you know, simply making people happy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Ezra, I'd like to turn to you at, at Google. How do you think about that balance between um, what increases the satisfaction and that feel good uh, sense amongst your users? And how do you think about what might be the right choices for them, including the heterogeneity of your users and how you yeah. put that in? Yeah, um, it's a great questions and that's a great question and I think there's a few questions there um so I think um I mean we want to enable users to make informed choices and engage choices and the right choices but we also want to make sure that users aren't overloaded uh, with the number of choices they have to make throughout the day and it's not just google that they are interacting with throughout the day they have many other ecosystems they go in and out of and so I think we want to, first of all, balance that um, emotional feeling of overload, anxiety over making the right choices and such uh, with making the right choices at the right time. So I think there are three primary questions that we try to ask, um, which is all centered around a user goal um, so that we can actually provide the right choices in the context of the user goal. And the first one is how do we design the right appropriate solution, design solutions? Because we know choice may create a friction either because it interrupts the task or because there are too many choices to make. But does this choice actually, how can we sort of balance the friction that this choice moment creates with the impact that the choice has? And the second one is where and when we present these choices so that they are most effective and useful. 
And the third is coming back to your question around like the multiplicity of user groups is what choices do we provide to the users um, that are relevant to their context, that are relevant to the languages they speak, that are relevant to their tech literacy. Um, and this all, I think, um, requires a iterative research process um, that doesn't just look at the usability uh, but also usefulness of choices. So the, these choices really help users achieve their goals in the most effective manner. Measure not just the behavioral aspects, but also the sentiments and attitudes users have about what choices they have to make throughout the day, the number of them, the frequency of them, the persistence of them, um, and also uh, test our solutions with multiple user groups. Because we, I think, taking um, thinking about our users as a monolithic group of users um, is detrimental um, to the solutions. So I want to make sure that we can, all the way from age groups to um, educational levels and more, but making sure that there are multiple groups that are being researched and designed for. And can you give us some examples of where you think you've got those three things really right in the design of Google's platforms? And if you're comfortable, an example of where you think you might not quite have the balance right. Um, I could um, I could maybe give an example um, of search, uh, where I think uh, many of us rely on it, and billions of users along around the world. Um, in terms of uh, how do we design the appropriate solution and provide the right choices, uh, we have. Um, millions of resources that we could provide to users. Um, and in that sense, if the users are asking, for example, uh, for factual information, like directions to a hospital, and then one could say, we don't maybe need to show the same information from 15 different providers. So they don't need to get a factual information uh, to reach uh, a hospital. So that's maybe where we are going to put the choices in the background and because the accuracy of the results is what's most important to the user at that point. Um, but if the same user, let's say, is looking for um, a used car, going back to the car example, then that's when comparing results and uh, different deals uh, dealerships uh, will be important and that's where we're going to introduce the choices to users. Um, so I think based on um, what the users is trying to accomplish and what in the first case and accurate information in the quickest way possible, the second one having a range of options so that they can make an informed decision based on their budget and preferences. I think that's maybe where we um, do a good job. In terms of where we may need to do a little bit more work is, um, is for example, the we have many products. Uh, so how do we actually like keep choice preferences coherent across these products? Is not something that we have, I think, yet done much work in. Um, so that users don't have to make the same choices again and again. So how do we in some ways respect the privacy of users, considering some devices are personal, some devices are public in the, in the, are shared in the same household? And how do we yet respect the choices that users make so that um, we're able to maintain them in, in, the, um, in, in a time-saving manner for the users without uh, with that, making them feel like their privacy is being compromised. Really interesting, thank you. Um, Andreas, I want to come back to you and explore this idea of the right choice for the, for the user. How do you think about that as a regulator and how do you balance um, the interests of the user with um, the interests of the platform and the broader market and competition dynamics? Yeah, that's a that's a difficult question because it it often shifts from I guess market to market. Um, but obviously, uh, we want to. So a very important part of our work is respecting that people have a like there's a plurality of preferences, 
uh, users are not the same, con consumers are not similar necessarily, and we want sort of a market that can cater to many, many different types of wants and needs. Um, so basically, I think we have a pretty common sense way of thinking about this, that um, users want to, at least in on reflection, to have privacy. And if that's the order of the business, they want to get great products for you know, as, as little as possible, maybe not cars in Germany, but on, on general, in general, we want to pay as little as possible for the best possible products. Um, so we, I think we respect what people, like we, we respect and ask obviously people, you know, what, what they want. Um, and it's our role to then think about how this translates when people interact with, with platforms and the consequences of their actions and interactions with platforms, and then try to sort of extrapolate the consequences on a societal level from that interaction. So, um, so there is a little bit of sort of going beyond just what people say they want. Um, we need to think about how you not as an individual consumer, you might not care a whole lot about what you know that the a company collects or a platform collects your data. But this fuels then the next link. It fuels that business's search platform, that business's ad tech, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to go a bit beyond and 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 think about how how you know everyday choices and everyday preferences turns into these colossal products in the end, simply because millions and millions of users interact with these platforms. Um, so basically, we don't we're not in the business of sort of telling people what they should want, but we do want them to get as far as little as possible. Thank you. Um, I want to come back to the tools of user design and choice architecture. Um, Eric, can I turn to you and, and ask you firstly, which of those levers do you think are the most powerful, but also which do you think are the most underutilized as well? Um, it's interesting because I think almost everybody thinks of defaults as the poster child of choice architecture, but I think they're good and they actually vary in effectiveness depending upon the setting. But there are other things that I think people don't realize that are very powerful and you know, sort of without doing too much of a Sophie's choice, which of my children are, are the most powerful, but among other things are sorting what is first makes a big difference in some settings. My favorite example is in the US election, it turns out even for president, whoever's first in the ballot gets a 1% increase in share. You know, and we know that on online settings, it's a very nice work on order effects on hotel rooms choice. So that's a very powerful, um, very powerful tool. But other things like how even just how you describe an attribute. Um, a favorite example of mine describing uh, ground beef is either 7% lean or 30% fat. It's the same thing, but even those labels can be very powerful. So there's a big array and what makes it even more interesting is they interact. So having one label can make sorting different. And so it's actually a, a hard thing to say what's best, but it's way beyond just defaults. And what about friction? Because I'm actually, so you might see from, I don't know how Clearly, you can see my background, but I'm I'm just I'm at the Shard in London today, teaching at Warwick Business School, um, and I've been teaching students this morning about the power of friction, both stripping it out of processes, but also adding it in intelligently. Um, can I can you comment on where you think there should be more or less friction in online platforms? So I, I it's, it's a great question because I think friction happens at the beginning of a decision. So the analogy I use is your GPS when you're driving. You put in a route, you say, I'll take that. And then you almost never choose that because you're then busy driving. And decision making, we often decide how we're going to make a decision. And then we never change that because we're too busy making a decision to sort of revisit that. So the question is basically the frictions are going to have their most influence at the very beginning. So just to use one example, which is relevant, uh, if I go to one more website and ask today, how do I want to manage my cookies? When my goal at that time is to book a flight, or to you know, order a new book, that's creating a friction to what I want to do, and therefore I dismiss it. Now, that's a serious issue. So Andreas would probably say that's something that um, is important for the market as a whole. S would say that may be the wrong time to ask that question. Now, it's because of friction that's the wrong time. It's an important decision. How can we get people to make that 
once across sites. That would be my claim. So that's a good example, at least in my mind, of, of where friction is keeping people from making an important choice. Yeah, I really love that example. Andreas, Ezra, what do you think? Um, yeah, I'll start. Um, so I think I think friction is really interesting. Like it's an interesting thing also from a like from for us as regulators to think about. Uh, so in traditional economics, I mean, simply going to the store is kind of a necessary evil for people to get what they want. So in so economics land, we want people to get their products almost instantaneously. So, um, and obviously throughout time, this has been the way, like friction has been a natural part of our process. We had to go to the store, we had to wait in line, we had to go to the post office to pay our bills, all these things. And now with the evolution of digital platforms and uh, evolution of digital online choice architecture, we are seeing sort of the ev evaporation of friction in many instances. We, we pay for stuff without even paying attention to it. Um, and I think we've, we are beginning to see some of the um, some of the negative sides of removing a lot of friction from the markets. So we recently had a, uh, we had work on subscriptions where we saw people paying for years for stuff they didn't really think about, or maybe didn't use, didn't want. Um, we see in certain markets that people get products with great consequences, maybe too fast. Um, so different types of financial products. Uh, we can also think about how this move from sort of one-to-one -one interactions every time we buy something towards a more subscription-based economy, how is that affecting our tendency to evaluate products and compare them between different providers? This is something where I think we feel that obviously we don't want more friction than we need, but we might need a little bit of friction. Uh, and we need to be very strategic because we also recognize that adding friction to businesses interface is a cost. Something I, uh, Esther can correct me here, but something that businesses hate us doing, uh, sort of is getting directly into their product development and telling them, you know, oh no, people must wait a bit here or you need more information here. Uh, so we need to be extremely, I think, um, careful about how we use friction, but I think we will be thinking more strategically about friction in the future. Um, I certainly hate that. I certainly don't hate that uh, you uh, have a very thoughtful uh, approach to this, and I am actually um, looking forward to that. We're going to be thinking about this together, because I do agree it's a really difficult decision. Um, and back to your question, Liz, on um, what's a bad example of choices, I think cookie consents is a terrible ex example of that. We all want our privacy to be, ex to be respected. And I think we had the regulators had the right intentions and, and wanted companies to do something about it. But the solution came, we came up with collectively uh, is a terrible experience. So in the past, we just didn't click any buttons and we supposedly shared the information that we didn't want to share with companies. And now we just accept cookies either because it's a prominent choice or it's just an annoyance and there's no time to read and customize what information we share with platforms versus we don't. So we have we still are in the same place from a privacy perspective, I think, except that we have more friction. And that's, I don't think that's what companies want, users want, or regulators want. Um, that's why I think the, the question around friction um, has to be balanced with impact. Um, what I mean by that is, is like, why does the choice appear? Um, back to Eric's point about like at the beginning of the journey in the middle of it to interrupt the user who's trying to get to the hospital because the search engine is asking which map provider they want to use to get to the hospital. Uh, so why does choice appear? And how complex is it to make the choice? How many choices are there to make? And what's the frequency uh, and persistence of choice? So those are the friction pieces. And then there's the impact which is basically, does this choice help me to make uh, my decision in an effective way um, and, and help me get to where I want to get to? We don't go to the store to go to the store, we go to the store. Uh, a choice is a means, not an end in itself. And how easy to change the choices when we set them up. 
Um, so in some ways, um, we want to deliver the like highest return on choice by balancing choice friction and choice impact. And sometimes it would mean that we actually pause and slow down the user and give them a moment to read an important text about the information that they're about to share with the platform. And we create a friction, but we do create a friction that is actually purposeful and serves a good purpose. And sometimes if it is a choice that could be later changed easily or doesn't have as much impact on users' users lives or the tasks they're trying to accomplish, then we put it in the background. We make it accessible, but we don't interrupt the user. And because it's so contextual and nuanced, I, that's why I think we do need a lot of um, research and move it from the abstract and take it to where the choice is taking place and what purpose should it serve. And maybe I can can draw you on that point on research because I, I absolutely agree. And I think there's so much for us all to learn collectively about how we make choices and behave online. And I wonder how you see your role within Google and how Google sees its role within society as as an, a company that can generate and share some of that research more broadly. Um, do you, I guess the question is, do you see it as a private good for Google to understand how users behave on its platform? Or do you see that as a public good for us all to build a knowledge and an understanding of, of online decision making? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we have already started um, and some of this research is already available, not just on choice, but uh, a lot of the research that we conduct is available. And I do feel like in this field, particularly, we are really keen on uh, not reinventing the wheel, first of all. Um, there are amazing, there's amazing literature um, in behavioral sciences, economics, legal fields. And um, so first of all, really building on it um, and um, building on that great foundation. Um, and then I think um, adding our piece, um, our piece as in adding the kind of research that we can conduct with our users on our platforms. Um, but also um, and we are really keen on partnering with Andrea's team um, so that um, we can actually combine our forces because I do think eventually academic scholars, practitioners, and regulators have the same end goal in mind, but we do see different parts of the, uh, of the picture. Um, so in that sense, I'm really also keen on finding ways to uh, conduct research collectively that we can't possibly conduct on our own um, and find ways in which we can actually um, share this research uh, while protecting business secrets, while protecting our the participants' privacy and such. But I am confident that um, we can reach a place where we are conducting meaningful research and um, and learning, so that we can um, reach that common goal. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we've got about seven minutes left, and each of you has has made reference to the future and the evolution of digital platforms. And I'd like to turn back to each of you and ask, what do you think the platforms of the future can and should look like? And particularly from the perspective of user-centric design. Eric, can I start with you? Well, I, sure. Um, here, here's the thing. I think many people, and I see in the chat questions like, is choice architecture ethical and two points, because I think it is important to get, first is there's no such thing as a neutral choice architecture. That is, there has to be a choice architecture. So let me use one example. I'm not picking on Google in particular, but it's actually a very great example. They have a great site called Google Flights that I use all the time. And they've made a decision, a very interesting decision to actually include the carbon emissions for the flights. Now that's very, that's gonna have an influence. So there's no neutral, you either have that or you don't have that. You know, you might think it's a nudge. Not having that is a nudge. It makes me, even if I want to be more sustainable, it makes it hard for me to do that. So that's a, an example. So I think the notion is that people worry about choice architecture as manipulation, but it also can be a very powerful tool for the good. I don't mean just 
it promotes sustainability. It can help me during my goals. So it could actually generate a choice set that is specific for me or default that's specific for me based on what it knows. Now that can also go bad, but it's clearly, I think the notion that the choice architecture is a partner in making a better choice is where platforms are going. Um, saying, to essentially making people our opinions of people a little bit more modest. You know, they aren't as great a decision makers as perhaps economics makes us think they are and help them make better decisions. One last quick example. Um, it turns out when you give people a choice of credit cards and tell them, here's what you're going to do, we show that only about 40% of people get it right. There's a huge opportunity there to help people make better choices. Um, and, you know, and hopefully a company that figures out how to do that can actually increase their market share and make some money at the same time. Absolutely. And also to where that underlying choice remains complex to help people navigate that choice as right. well. Fantastic. Um, Andreas, what do you think is in the, what are the best platforms for the future to use your phrase from your introduction? The best platforms for the future, uh, without naming any specific platforms from the pet from the present, um, I think the best platforms for the future are ones who think about consumer and user welfare holistically, and who take a, I think, a more protective view on uh, how consumers interact once they are at a platform. I think increasingly we are seeing platforms who shape large parts of everyday pay people's lives uh, what we, you know what we buy what we watch who we talk to and how um, and I, I think having a having a stronger sense of responsibility for users is something we'll see in the future I think if if not out of their, the goodness of their heart then because regulation will evolve and and sort of force businesses to be more holistically when they when they interact so, and I mean this in very practical terms, like not just asking because you have to out of regulation, but designing good questions for their users. You know, how do you want your privacy settings? What type of products do you want to be shown? All these things that we can sort of play whack-a-mole today and put in paragraphs here and there, you know, mandating businesses how they must interact with businesses or with consumers. But I think in the future, we will have regulation that sort of puts it on the platform and enables us to put it on the platform, you know, what good our choice architecture actually looks like, and then lets platforms um, do what they're best to, which is basically designing really, really good choice architecture, but keeping in mind this more holistic approach to consumer welfare. Thank you. Ezra, over to you. Um, plus one to and what Andreas said in terms of user welfare and consumer welfare. Um, hopefully platforms are going in a direction, uh, ideally will go in a direction where they are trying to optimize user welfare, not just because of the solutions that they provide and the choices they, meaningful choices they present, but also um, I think um, there's going to be more accountability um, and, and I think that is not just a regulatory push, I think, but also I think users are getting more empowered and informed, which is amazing. And um, so I think companies are going to willingly um, and some unwillingly perhaps um, going to take that also as a reference point and that accountability um, because users have choices on any any platform. Users have cho have choices to choose another. So I think in that sense, like whether or not you're empowering your users in the right way, will be a, almost a selling point, I think. And there will be more accountability and responsibility on the side of um, users. Um, so in that sense, better design, a more powerful user experience effective solutions and doing it in a responsible manner where we are respecting users' attention, <laughs> users' privacy, I think are going to be matters of, um, of consumer choices. So I think uh, there, I, I am, I'm seeing more accountability on the rise in that sense. Really interesting. Um, in keeping with the, the theme of the conference as a whole, I'm going to ask you all to wrap up with just one sentence and completing the sentence in the future, digital platforms will. Ezra, can I start with you? 
uh, will be more complex um, and require uh, experts from multiple fields to to improve. Honestly, and that's why I am I'm uh, keen on being part of this panel. I am keen on continuing these conversations. Um, yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Andreas. In the future, digital platforms will. Uh, be more responsible. Mm -hmm. Great. And Eric, what do you think? Um, help improve consumer decision and consumer's welfare. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to my panelists, to Eric, to Andreas, and to Ezra. You've all brought very different and interesting perspectives to this discussion. And um, thank you very much. I'm going to hand back now to Laura, who's going to introduce the next session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, Ezra, Eric, and Andreas for this excellent panel. Um, clearly, this is a very important topic for today, but also will um, be even more so in the future uh, with uh, web, web3 platforms going forward. So um, we are now going to move to our next panel, Scaling Sustainable Platforms. And uh, I am going to introduce you to our moderator, Jennifer Schenker. Um, Jennifer is an award-winning journalist who has been covering the global tech industry for many years. Um, she worked full-time in the past for the Wall Street Journal Europe, Time Magazine, International Herald Tribune, Red Herring, and Business Week. She's currently the founder and editor-in-chief of The Innovator, the publication about digital transformation. Uh, Jennifer has written extensively about the platform economy and has previous moderated uh, previously moderated a couple of panels for platform leaders. So we're delighted to welcome her back today, straight from Davos, uh, where she's been attending every year for the past 21 years. So Jennifer, welcome and over to you. Thank you, Laura, for that really lovely um, introduction and um, welcome everyone to the session on sustainable platforms. As Claire mentioned, um, <clears throat> I've just come back from the World Economic Forum's annual meeting in Davos and a big focus this year was on what needs to be done to get to net zero. The answer is a lot. Sadly, global carbon emissions rebounded in 2021 to reach their highest annual level ever. Currently, only 9% of extracted materials are reused and 62% of global greenhouse gases are emitted during extraction, processing, and production of goods. Global use of materials has in fact more than tripled in the past 50 years and it's set to double again by 2050, unless new approaches are adopted. Looking at today's consumption levels, sustaining our current growth trajectory would require the ecological resources of 2.3 planets by 2050, according to the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. This number is significantly higher for mature markets. The US, for example, would need five planets to sustain present day consumption levels. Germany would need three. The good news is that it's possible to decouple our world's growth from the consumption of the Earth's resources by shifting from a linear take, make, waste economy to a circular reduce, reuse, recycle one. Here to tell us how that's done are Lucy Bosch, co-founder and CEO of Too Good To Go, Peter Winnishofer, co-founder and CEO of Refurbed, and Marty Eskersel, a managing partner at Bonsai Partners, an investor in Refurbed. Lucy, would you, uh, would you kick off this session by giving us a two minute overview of Too Good To Go? Yeah, it was high pleasure, Jennifer. Thanks a lot for having us and for organizing that, that important event. I'm really glad to be with you today and, and talk a little bit about how platform can, can truly have an impact in the world. We, we started Too Good To Go now six years ago and with really the, the ambition of building a global movement for fighting food waste. So we realized that today we throw away 40% of the food we produce 
And we just couldn't accept that. We couldn't accept that we throw away so much food when so many people go to bed hungry every night, when that represents 10% of greenhouse gases emission. And when even economically speaking, it makes no sense to, to throw away $1.3 trillion of food every year. So with that in mind, we were like full of, um, of ambition to create a platform that would connect stores, uh, food stores that might have leftovers at the end of the day to consumers, people like you and me, who can come and collect at the end of the day, all the food that would have been thrown away 10 minutes later. So it's really about using an app and using technology to connect the right people at the right time and help them um, to save food together. So six years later, this actually happens across 17 countries, 15 in Europe, but also the US and Canada uh, since 2020. We save more than 300,000 meals every day from the trash. And this actually gather a community of close to 60 million consumers and 150,000 stores. So this actually proves that we can really use technology to make a difference. And that also, um, when you reduce food waste, you create value. Therefore, our business model is really aligned with our ecological impact. For every meal we save, we take roughly $1, one euro. And that helps us to build a strong revenue as well. Because today, since the start, we've saved close to 150 million meals. Therefore, we also generated more than 150 million uh, euros revenue. And for me, that's the important point, is making sure that the businesses we create for tomorrow are businesses that truly align societal interest and, and really making a positive impact through building a strong business model as well and showing that it's possible to build a profitable company eventually while really always aiming for impact because our, our KPI, um, our most important KPI since the start is, uh, has been and is still today, the number of meals we save every day. And that is so important for me. And once we've built that, it's, it's also really give us the opportunity to talk more widely about what food waste is. And today we're not only using the app to have an impact, we also launch many initiatives beyond the app to talk to politics and businesses and schools on how we can reduce food waste in their daily life and really embark the whole society into a mindset change uh, for the long term. So that's uh, to get to go in a nutshell. That's great, Lucy. Thank you. Very impressive. Um, let me turn now to you, Peter. Um, tell us a little bit for people who maybe aren't familiar with Refurb. Tell us a little bit about what you do. Sure, happy to. So we we founded Refurb five years ago, and we had a very similar dream and idea like Lucy. We looked at consumption as a whole and found, as you mentioned earlier, Jennifer. It's crazy that we have a linear model, right? We produce stuff, then we use it once or twice, maybe for a year or two, and then we throw it away. Or it's, you know, with electronics, it's in our cupboards, right? And uh, every person at home, every household has between eight and 10 old electronic devices lying around, not being used anymore. And that's crazy, right? That's something that we have to solve. And that's what we wanted to solve five years ago. That's why we found Refurb. What we did is we built a marketplace that actually connects refurbishers to companies that refurbish to renew all the electronic devices and they, we connect them through our platform to consumers. So we made sure that people can actually buy these products, that they have access to it, that they have access to high quality refurbished equipment. And we built this platform in both ways. So consumers can also sell back their old devices to refurbishers. And for that, we've been very successful so far. We have more than a million customers across six markets, um, did a couple of hundred million of uh, turnover last year and yeah, are growing very quickly. And by now actually looking at other product categories as well, right? Because electronics is obviously something that is very bad for our environment. Basically, if you think about it, everything that we buy as a consumer has a negative impact on our planet. So we're now actually venturing out into other product categories like fashion, sports equipment, furniture, and so on and offer a holistic platform for you as a consumer to buy all sorts of products that you might want to buy. And ultimately our goal is to make it as easy as possible for a consumer to live sustainable because unfortunately we believe consumption will not stop, but we have to make consumption sustainable. And that's the only way we can actually stop climate change. Absolutely. 
Thank you so much. Let me turn to you now, Marty. Can you tell us, uh, you're an investor in Refurb, but you know, tell us a little bit about uh, Bonsai Ventures and your fund. Yes, um, <clears throat> thanks uh, Jennifer for the introduction and also thanks uh, to Platform Leaders for, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. So yes, I, I'm, I'm managing partner at, at Bonsai Partners. Uh, we are a, a VC that started to invest back in 2001. So we have now 21 years of, of track record investing in tech startups. This is what we do, right? We are not uh, uh, an ESG focused uh, VC, but rather uh, a tech uh, VC, right? Um, so our, our investment strategy has been crafted during these uh, more than 20 years. Um, we, we, where we have gone through different crises, uh, no? from uh, internet uh, 1.0 to web 3 uh, and, um, and different economic uh, cycles, just to mention uh, two of the many global factors that we have gone through these, these times. And basically, our investment strategy has four pillars, which is uh, we are a multi-stage investors going from uh, pre-series A to uh, series C. We are agnostic in terms of, uh, of business model and, and sector, but we are always software driven. Um, third, we combine um, primary cash in deals uh, with uh, pure secondary uh, transactions, which are typically done in between rounds. And geographically, we invest um, mainly in Europe, but exceptionally, we can invest uh, beyond. So as you see, I have not mm, mentioned ESG, as uh, we can come back later on uh, about this, but I can tell you that the, the percentage of ESG investment that we have done uh, has been uh, growing no, in, in the last years, clearly, although we don't have this in our, in our investment strategy. We are um, about to start investing um, now our, our next fund, which is a, a 160 million uh, fund um, that, uh, that will be writing initial tickets of between two up to four to five million as initial tickets. And later on, we can build up our position in, in, in the portfolio companies over uh, 10 million uh, approximately. So back in, in March 2019, so literally one or two weeks before the first COVID uh, lockdown, um, we invested with our previous fund in Refurbs uh, Series A. We invested again uh, last year in its Series B. So we are a happy and, uh, and, and very, very passionate investor about uh, Peter's team. And um, yeah, besides Refurb, we have also we are also investors in, in companies such as Casabo, which is uh, which is the leading European uh, iBuyer buyer prop tech, or Sendcloud, which is a logistics aggregator serving uh, thousands of e-commerce uh, across Europe, uh, based in, in the Netherlands, or or Exotica, which is an next uh, generation. Uh, tour operator, which main market is the US, but it's a company uh, based in, in, in Spain. And in the past, some, some of the companies where we have invested and that we exited, um, just to mention a few, which are B2C and probably well-known rather in the southern part of Europe, uh, companies such as Idealista, Softoni, uh, Infojobs, Globo, um, uh, and PAC. No? So this is about uh, Bonsai Partners, which I insist I can give you later on some more figures, but we are not an ESG uh, focused investor, but of course we do ESG investors because I think that this is quite similar to technology. No, uh, Technology back in 2001 was something uh, specific and right now technology is kind of everywhere. No, You cannot imagine a business which uh, has not a tech angle. So I think that with ESG is happening uh, kind of the same. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to just ask you a quick follow-up question, going back to what like Lucy had said earlier about, you know, she felt <clears throat> from the beginning that it was very important that a company based on ESG be, um, be 
you know, revenue generating and be a good, uh, a good solid business. So, um, you know, do you, are you seeing that companies that have, you know, sustainability as part of their mission, um, you know, is it reinforcing the idea that companies can do well by doing good? Absolutely, but um, so the, the the investment thesis that we had when we invested in Refer in the end was the same as as we have in in any other investment. No, that um, so our investment criteria was the same and basically can be summarized in three very basic things. No, uh, Refer it. Uh, had and has a great founding team combining different sets of skills, um, really strong founders, uh, and, and with some of them combining or having the experience in, in the sector, having also the tech part with a very good CTO and Peter also with a, with a great, great experience. So that's the first, and that's a must for any investment that we do. Secondly, they had a great product so we could see the the product market fit right and um and third they are in a huge and growing fast market right um so that's the investment criteria that uh, that that we were uh analyzing in the case of refer and that in the end we analyze in any investment that we do but um but actually, um, as I was saying before, no, refer is not an exception with our with our portfolio um, in terms of ESG investments, and 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 clearly this has been growing within our portfolio. And just to give you a, a couple of uh, of numbers here, comparing our last fund, uh, which is the fund that invested in Refer and that was a fund raised at the end of 2018. So comparing this last fund with our former track record, the percentage of, um, of investment in ESG companies has grown from 18% to slightly over 50, 50 uh, in this uh, last fund. But interestingly, if um, the fair value of these ESG investments um, represent 70%. So in terms of investment cost is approximately 50%, but the fair value is 70% of these ESG investments. And actually, um, if we look at the multiple, the multiple of the ESG investments is uh, a bit over two times bigger than the multiple of the non-ESG investments. That's of really course, uh, all this is not explained by the ESG uh, component. There are many other uh, components, sure. but uh, uh, in a nutshell, clearly the performance of the ESG investments uh, is pretty good uh, within our uh, portfolio. Okay, great. Thanks. So, Lucy, let me turn to you. You know, who did you, who have you raised money from? And, and was it difficult at the beginning? Because I think there is this growing recognition now from, from investors that this is kind of the way to go. But when you started out, that might not have been the case. No, for sure. And actually, that was one of our key considerations when we started is we, we really wanted to stay away from VCs because we were worried they would kind of change our DNA or or not respect our values or our ambition to, to truly change the world, whatever the EBITDA and the, and the profit was uh, at the start. So, uh, so actually for the first four years, uh, we, we stayed away from, uh, from venture capital. We had uh, some great entrepreneurs who, who truly believed in our mission and, and became our business angels. Um, and, and we had the opportunity to actually make revenue from day one as well, uh, meaning it was actually when like we had to be creative obviously and uh, we couldn't pay ourselves uh, from day one as, uh, as co-founders but um but we we really made that uh, conscious decision of not uh, not going for vcs too early because we wanted to make sure that we could actually deliver on uh, on what we wanted to do uh, today we the first time we raised uh, from a vc uh, it's a, it's a b corp certified vc and it's really because we found um bliss um, a venture capital that is uh, truly aligned with our with our values, with our mission, 
who actually asked in the due diligence process, how do you ensure diversity in your top management or how are you gonna protect your mission long-term? So after like recently, we've seen more and more interest from VCs to actually do a full due diligence process and not only do a financial one, but really looking at like what's our full impact uh, on, on the world and, uh, and in our society. And, and therefore we, we could trust them and, and we build a really strong partnership. For me, that's the future of, of the financial world is, is really reinventing the KPIs of tomorrow to define what, what value is in a holistic view and not in a financial, uh, in a financial perspective. So, uh, so that's where we are today. Okay, thanks, Peter. Let me turn to you now, and you know, let's talk about because to have impact, obviously, you, you have to scale. So, how do you balance growth with ensuring the quality of the products that are sold on your platform? Because you're you're dealing with third parties there, and then, you know, so what kind of governance principles have you put in place? Yeah, absolutely, extremely important for us, right? Because I fundamentally believe that every business is only successful if they manage to deliver ha customer happiness, right? So that's the most important thing for us is to make our customers happy. So what we do there is we build a series of systems that align the incentives of our merchants, which mostly is making money with our incentive and our goal of making sure that our customers are happy. And so what we do there is we build a lot of technology that automatically checks the quality of the products but not by physically touching the products, but actually by analyzing the kind of messages that our merchants get, by analyzing the reviews they get, by the refund statistics and the defect rates they have. And so we analyze all of that and we put it into algorithms that we have in the platform that actually promote merchants that have high quality versus actually ranks merchants with lower quality much lower, right? So basically, we automatically promote people with greater quality. And for that, we actually incentivize merchants to improve their quality because if they sell products with bad quality, they're not making any money. And so for these systems, and we have like three or four of these, we actually make sure that we have found a very efficient way to quality control the products without actually physically touching them. Super interesting. Thank you, Peter. So Lucy, still on this whole um, topic of scaling, um, you have, you mentioned earlier, you, you have so many consumers who've signed up. Um, what do you find to be the most challenging about getting the word out to stores and, and getting them into the system? Yeah. Um, so I would say as a short answer, people are busy, right? So finding the right um, the right decision maker, getting them to understand what we do and, and just give us some, uh, some uh, bandwidth to, uh, to actually join it is the most difficult. And today we could gather 150,000 um, stores. So it, it's huge, but in a way we're so supply constrained. When you look at like matching supply and demand, I mean, today uh, close to 90% of our, of our meals are being saved. So it's really about adding stores uh, to, to keep on growing and to keep on saving more food. And, and for that, we need to reach out to the right decision maker. Once we have them, then it's fairly easy to sell because, um, you know, I mean, there is, no, there is no cons on like saving your food, generating a new consumer flow and putting, um, showing that your brand is doing the right thing, sustainably speaking as well. So it's really a win-win-win for the stores. Um, and it's also super simple to implement operationally in the stores. So, uh, so that's why we, um, we, we could go so fast but we're still being slowed down by just uh, the attention span uh, that uh, a business owner today uh, can, uh, can, can give to, uh, to a platform like ours. Thanks. Um, so Peter, um, do you find a difference in trying to scale in different European uh, countries? And if so, you know, what are those differences and what do you find the most challenging? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in general, we have very universal products, right? An iPhone is the same in France, Germany, or Sweden. What we do see is that the consumer motives are very different, especially in Nordics and also in Germany and Austria. Sustainability is very important for consumers, right? Consumers really care about sustainability, and that's a big anchoring point in our messaging. But what we see in other countries, for example, in Italy, this is a bit less important. Um, but especially if you look at more Eastern European countries, 
we see the sustainability has not the same level of attention than it has, for example, in, in Central or Northern Europe. So we have to adjust our messaging a bit and also play with the USPs of the platform to attract different types of consumers in different markets. Okay, thank you. So Lucy, you mentioned the idea, you know, this idea of you've got to get the mind share of um, the, the right people at the stores. What, what are some of the other key challenges in scaling your business? Oh, do you have an hour? Um, no, I would say it's many challenges, but I mean, it, it's part of the game, right? Um, we, in Too Good To Go, we grew um, really fast in terms of number of people as well. Uh, today, we have, uh, we have more than 1,200 employees uh, across 17 markets. So, you know, when I still remember being like uh, just uh, uh, some, uh, a bunch of people uh, just trying to do all the jobs and stuff, and then suddenly you have a team of experts who definitely know the job better than you do. Um, and it's really about finding the right um, speed to grow this team, always taking care of your, of your culture and of your DNA and making sure that you keep repeating and repeating and repeating again, what's your vision, what's your mission, what are your values so that you can grow in the right way. Um, and then it's also finding the right balance of uh, how fast can you grow a team and um, how heavy it is as well in terms of like budgets, because uh, our workforce is, is expensive today when you think about uh, paying the salaries every month. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really finding the, the, the balance and also structuring uh, the team and making sure that you have your strategy and you build the right structure to deliver on that strategy, but that you can also kind of um, adapt the structure to the talents you have in the company because they want to grow as well, right? And they want a career and they want some growth path. So it's it's really a yeah it's 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 a constant refining of uh, of how do you make the most out of your current workforce and how do you find how do you attract the right capabilities for building the future because every employee is at to get to go when they join and a year later and two years later their job is just so different because we're growing so fast so that's really kind of um, what we need to. I think for me, the biggest challenge uh, in building a company is, uh, is making sure that the, the people and the mission uh, are, are, are in a win-win uh, context uh, continuously. Okay, thanks. So <clears throat> my next question is, uh, well, let's start with you, Peter, and then I'll come back to you, Lucy. Are there specific things that policymakers and regulators could do to make your life easier? Uh, Peter, I'll start with you. Uh, there are many, many things that they could do. Uh, bureaucracy is unbelievable. Like in a country like Austria, where I actually thought before becoming an entrepreneur that doing business is actually easy. There are many, many small things that really take a lot of our time, right? But I actually don't want to talk about these small things. If we think about it in a bigger context, what we really see with the products that we're selling, that obviously sustainability is an important point for our customers, but price as well. And so I believe that price is the ultimate, the ultimate um, way to really motivate people to live more sustainably. And I believe that there has to be a different tax regime in place that massively incentivizes people through taxes or through you know, cheaper prices or lower VAT on sustainable products. So what I mean with that specifically is that VAT, VAT for sustainable products has to be reduced massively, right? Because most products out there that are sustainable are more expensive than the conventional alternative. And as long as that is the case, people will not change that much, right? Because we will see a slow change, but what made us so successful is that we don't only have sustainable products, but they're also cheaper than you. And this combination is really drove our growth because there is no downside for people. And that's ultimately one of the biggest barriers, I think, for uh, sustainable consumption if you look at the bigger, if you look at it on a bigger scheme of things, and so this is what policymakers should have to do: make sustainability cheaper for everybody. Okay, thank you, Lucy. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, definitely aligned with uh, with Peter. There is many things. There are many things they can do. Um, I, I would say that um, for, for too good to go specifically. I mean, um, the the way we did it is never wait for them. 
because they are going so much lower than we can in a way you know they have so many stakeholders and they have their political system which which makes it so so hard um so we we run and we we never forget about them right it's really about getting the private and the public sector to work together but for me the private sector is the most efficient vehicle for driving impact and therefore it's it's really about um doing it and then making sure that our ecosystem is aware both charities and um, and, and and public and the public system so we've for example we've done a, a huge work on date labeling with our partners with the biggest uh, industry uh, food industrials with the biggest um, manufacturers supermarkets and we've aligned what date labeling uh, should be tomorrow and then we went to the ministry both local and um, national but also at a european level and told them that's the work we've done those are the best practices we could implement can you make that the new regulation, the new norm, so that everybody does it? And that's where, for me, like we can pilot many initiatives, prove the results, and then they are here to roll it out and make sure that the best practices become the norms. So that's, for me, that's the way we, we continue to work with them. And that's how we, we will help each other in the best way. Thanks. We have, an, uh, we have a, a question from the audience I'd like to bring in. It's a follow-up question to you. Um, and the, the person is asking, how do you design the architecture at Too Good To Go? Is there a side of the platform that you give more emphasis and which tools do you use? Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a great question actually, because uh, historically, because we were so supply constrained, we've always put, put our effort in um, building a strong um, platform for stores. And we were always thinking about how can we design the simplest tool for them so that we can really provide them a solution for fighting food waste. And we know that the demand will follow. Uh, and we've really been in that, in, that, um, in that reflection from the start. I would say since 2020 and, and, and since COVID, the world has changed a little bit. Consumers, um, consumers' habits uh, and consumers' needs are much different uh, than they were before. They are a lot more unpredictable. Uh, I don't know what other things of that, but for us, we really saw that it was a lot harder to, to, um, to predict uh, our consumers' behaviors. So now we work, um, we want to become a lot more consumer centric and we're really building uh, the apps a lot more and our product in general around uh, what consumers um, what consumers want. So I would say it's, it's a constant, uh, at the end of the day, you have to do both, um, but it's really about what's your bottleneck for growth and where do you focus uh, based on that? So, um, so that's, that's kind of like the, the strategy we, we use to, to design our, our platform. Thanks. Um, so Peter, let me turn to you then about the evolution of your platform. You mentioned briefly early on that you know, you want to expand from electronics into clothing, maybe even furniture. I mean, what is the vision? Do you want to become the eBay of like, you know, refurbished um, everything? What, what's, what's the vision and, and what do you see as the challenges of, you know, moving into new verticals? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the way we think about it is, that we're very close to our customers, right? And we try to engage with customers as much as possible. And so when we, we talk to them, what they basically say is they would like to buy more sustainable products, but it's actually really hard to, first of all, get them, uh, get them in a meaningful way. And the second one is to understand whether or not the product is actually sustainable or if it's just another form of greenwashing, right? It's very, very complicated for consumers to really understand which product is really sustainable and which one is actually being greenwashed. And right now, every single company on earth is, is suddenly sustainable. So it's becoming even more difficult for people to understand. And so what we're doing is we want to be the gatekeeper of sustainability. So it means all the products that we sell on our platform are truly sustainable, or at least are the most sustainable option that is on the market. And with that promise, we're solving that issue for a lot of consumers, right? Ultimately, we believe in e-commerce and inconvenience of that. So we actually don't want to build the eBay because I think there are a lot of flaws in the platform. What we want to rebuild is the green version of Amazon or the Amazon for sustainability. Because we believe in the convenience of Amazon, I think they're doing a great job. I think they're you know, 
not great from it for a number of reasons if you look at the, the impact that the company has but from the business model and the convenience aspect they did a lot of things right and so we want to recreate that for sustainability how, how would you go about um let's just take something like furniture right like you would have to connect with um i guess artisans people who you know take pride in you know re re redoing uh, furniture and giving them a new life, right? How, yeah. how do you how do you connect into those communities? And same question as with the electronics, how do you, you know, guarantee the quality? No, exactly. So what, what we have to do as a platform is that we have to connect to the right people, right? We have to find the right um, furniture refurbishers or the producers of sustainable furniture and get them on a the platform. The good thing is that this is what we've been doing over the last few years within electronics and these conversations with these brands or these companies are fairly similar across categories and right? so there's not a big difference what is great about this is that we already have the technology to connect to them to the erp systems etc we have the technology to run ads for these categories so there's a lot of things to be built that we can actually use across different categories and on top of that we have a customer base that really likes to buy these products from us but of course, is the case that it's very the customer journey is very different from buying a smartphone to buying a couch. Right? So this yeah. is very different. Uh, but this is something that we're rebuilding right now, where we get a lot of experts actually from these industries, because this knowledge is is not something that we have to reinvent. Right? We don't have to reinvent the wheel. But there are a lot of people that know how to sell these, and they're more than happy to work with us because. We, with our mission and the impact as a business, are very attractive for a lot of talent that want to do their part in saving the world. And that's why it's actually very easy, easy for us to get the best people on board. And with the best people, we can solve any challenge. Thank you. Marty, let me go to turn to you and say, as an investor, what do you see as you know the new opportunities that the circular economy uh, can, can open up? so um yeah um so we we are we are actually investors in in in, in other circular economy uh startups um for instance we are investors in in go trendy go trendier which is a, a second hand marketplace for for fashion especially for for women uh, operating in mexico and, and colombia so it's it's a similar model to vinted and uh Europe, no, or or Poshmark in in the US. So very interesting model, growing rapidly and 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 in a healthy way. So I would say that one of the things that we are seeing uh, is that that the market is it's true what what uh, Peter was saying before about about the difference, no, uh, in between the different European countries, but we see a general trend on on. Towards the circular economy and 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 a general acceptance of of the secondhand products, right? Uh, whether refurbished or not refurbished. Then we we have been also investors in in Wallapop, which is uh, which is another uh, leading peer to peer secondhand marketplace in in Spain. Um, uh, where where it's extremely successful and and. They have actually volumes um, of transactions uh, absolutely comparable to the, to the biggest traditional retailers. Uh, and now they are growing towards Italy and, and Portugal. So again, uh, again, the same model peer to peer of, uh, of a circular economy, right? Um, in that case, it's, it's, uh, it's not like a go trendier or refurbished which are in a particular vertical but it's it's a it's an horizontal uh, marketplace and then another sector uh, where where we have had uh, where we have invested is in, in in the case of of the of cars no? which i would say it's the probably the first uh, circular uh, good no that we are used to 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 buy and sell uh second hand right so in that case we invested in in an italian company which is broom broom uh which has a, a very similar model 
as referred, but with cars. So they buy uh, uh, cars in bulk, and they, uh, in that case, they do the refurbishment uh, by themselves with, uh, with within their own factory. Um, and they were actually presently bought by Kazoo, which is the leading player at European level, which is a company based in, in the UK, and it's in the process of doing a build-up of, uh, of these kind of players. Um, so just, no, just to mention three different examples of circular economy uh, within different uh, verticals. And in one case, I would say it's a, it's a managed marketplace, no? Uh, in the sense that uh, they go through a refurbishment process uh, similar to what uh, uh, refer uh, does, and in other cases, it's something which is you no know, probably more um, similar to what eBay has been doing for years. But still, there's huge demand on, on this, and there's still opportunity of going uh, into some uh, specific verticals. No? And that's only what uh, relates to circular economy. But then, uh, so besides these on ESG investments, no, we can find other verticals no, related to, I don't know, logistics, which I think that it's also a, a, a big challenge uh, for all these actually uh, circular uh, marketplaces and any other uh, e-commerce. We are looking at opportunities in, in the water savings uh, for uh, agriculture, um, also in terms of e-signature solutions. No? It's another way also of having uh, a sustainability impact. So there are many other, of course, uh, sustainability angles uh, that, uh, that we are seeing, that we have invested in the past, and that we will we'll keep uh, investing in the future, for, for sure. Thank you. Do, do the panelists see, um, it, it seems to me there's a, an opportunity to recycle so much more, like let's just take home appliances, people get rid of their washing machines or whatever, and that may not, that could still be used by someone else, especially if they were refurbished. Do, do you believe that traditional players like, uh, I don't know, Darty in France or others will start to get into this, the platform business of recycling uh, 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 things? Or do you think that it's going to be new, newer players like you who will um, really run away with the market? I, I mean, if I can start by answering, I, I would say both definitely. Uh, I think they have to. They they can't just uh, not do it. I think it's it's the movement is is growing too fast. It's still quite uh, light weighted, if we can call it like that. But it's uh, it's it's moving fast. And I mean, I've uh, I've I've talked uh, previously about the um, the benefits of too good to go. But you can do that with any circular economy, right? It's it's good for the environment. It's good for um, just making sense, and it's also good for profit. So there, there is no way they continue operate, operating with throwing away that much because it just it just doesn't make sense. So so they have to move this way. At the same time, there are of course newer players and newborn who who just create uh, themselves around that DNA and, and have it so central that we can actually go much faster. Um, for us at Too Good To Go, it's it's just easier to you know to do the right thing because we we were born like that. Whereas yeah. when you have to completely shift the way you usually operate, of course, it takes time. It takes effort. I have tons of respect for the huge corporation that, that try and do it. But of course, it's uh, it's going to take years, but they have to. Otherwise, they won't be here in 20 years anymore. So, Peter, let me ask you, what do you think traditional companies could learn from company uh, companies like Refurbed or Too Good To Go um, and, and, and in terms of operating these kind of platforms? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the businesses, I think, are fundamentally different. There's so, so many things that are different and that we can learn from them, but they also can learn from us. I think one thing that is, that for the that sense as a part of the platform is the speed that we operate in, but also the way we do business, right? We really focus on our core competence, which is building the platform. And for example, letting the refurbishment be done by our merchants, right? Mm -hmm. And so we really believe in partnerships and bringing the strength of each partner to the table and create something bigger than we could do our, on our own, right? And if we 
talking with companies like Tarti, et cetera, these big uh, electronics retailers, um, I think that's something that, that we can actually um, teach them a bit. Great, perfect. So with one minute to go, I'm gonna ask each of you um, to complete the following sentence. For you, the future of sustainable platforms is, Marty, you wanna start? For me, it's about traceability of the item sold, which brings to credibility. Okay, uh, Lucy. It's about refining the way we measure performance and, and really um, having new KPIs to define um, what, what a good platform is. Um, and those need to be linked with our environmental and, uh, and social impact. Thanks, Peter, you get the last word. Yeah, for me, it's really about building a holistic product offering for consumers that is not just about sustainability. Of course, sustainability has to be the foundation, but there has to be all the other elements of the expectation of the customer met, right? Which means price, which means quality, which means convenience. And if you as a business can bring value to all of these, then you have a very bright future. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, all of our panelists um, you, for inspiring us, enlightening us. And I will pass over to Benoit. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, so we designed today's program around three key topics, Web3, and the question is, you know, what is Web3 and what does it mean? Um, platform design, and how do you design platforms, not just platforms that are easy to use, but platforms that allow you to make the right decisions. And the last topic was, we just talked about it, uh, how do you scale sustainable platforms and how do you um, empower the uh, circular economy. So I'd like to take five minutes really to come back uh, briefly on each of these topics. So the Web3 is a new concept and you've got lots of definitions um, and, uh, and it feels a little bit like the, uh, the early 90s um, when, when the web uh, started you know, you're in 94, 95 and everybody is talking about uh, the technology and you've got lots of acronyms around and you know like html cpip ftp at the time and today uh we're talking about web3 and it's also emerging and you've got acronyms like uh, uh nfts non-fungible tokens and people talk about crypto and they talk about you know smart contracts etc and these things are very important they're very exciting these are the new technologies these are the new building blocks but what is really important is to think about how these things are going to be combined uh, in order to enable uh, new business cases, new business models, and uh, new ways of creating value. So uh, you're going to, to hear about um, you know, things that we can't do today that are possible in the Web3 world. So people start talking about um, sort of distributed or decentralized autonomous organizations, uh, DAOs, uh, and, uh, and how you design uh, governance within these, uh, these new ecosystems. So it's very interesting to, uh, to listen to, uh, to Frederick and, and, and his experience. Um, and, uh, and I look forward to seeing these new business mo models uh, emerge. Now, it will take time. Uh, we see just the premises of this. And one thing we've learned from the, the past wave is that uh, you don't just flick a switch. So things will coexist, traditional businesses, web, existing web platforms, and Web3 innovations will coexist for years to come. And I'm sure it's a topic we'll uh, revisit in the future. Now, the second topic um, was about customer centricity. Uh, so it, we often think about platform design, and we often think about how, how do we remove friction? How do we make the platform uh, easy to use? And we certainly see that with, uh, with our uh, clients. But fundamentally, the design goes further. And it was great to hear from, uh, from, from Google as well. How do you make sure people not only uh, can use the, the platform easily, but can make the right decisions? How do you enable the right outcomes? Uh, and that's, uh, that requires uh, lots of thinking around choice architecture and uh, and using friction in a more strategic way. So when it's a very important uh, decision that you're about to make, and 
and God knows that you know we we buy important things, cars, houses. We we even select our life partners with uh, uh, with platforms these days. Uh, so it's very important to get these these decisions right. And adding friction at key points in the decision making process can be the right thing to do. And in some other cases, you want to remove uh, friction to make it easy. So uh, you really need to think. Uh, carefully about uh, your choice architecture when you uh, when you build a platform. Um, th there's a great book on the topic from uh, uh, Professor Eric Johnson, who was with us today. Um, so I'm uh, I'm reading it and it's highly recommended. So if you're interested in choice architecture, the Elements of Choice by uh, Eric Johnson is a uh, is highly recommended. Now, the third topic uh, was sustainability, and Sustainability is, is increasingly important. Uh, I mean, Too Good To Go reminded us that more than 30% of uh, all food is uh, being wasted, clearly not possible. Food is becoming an increasingly scarce resource, so we uh, really need to, uh, to look at that. Refurb was talking about the uh, e-waste category. Uh, it's the fastest growing category of, uh, uh, of waste, so it's all the electronic devices we've got uh, around the house, uh, and how do you give them a new life? How do you recycle them in in, in uh, the process and refer was the the, the company we uh, we heard from um now it was very interesting to hear from marty as well that you don't need to have an esg investment thesis to actually channel uh, money in these new businesses this is where talents are going and this is where the uh, interesting uh projects tend to be with with huge market potential uh just an on, on financial ground. So it's, it's, it's great to have a holistic uh, view of the impact of these companies, but now, uh, you know, smart money is, is, is investing uh, in these projects as well. That's certainly our experience um, uh, at Launchworks where the vast majority of our projects have got a, a very strong ESG component. So, uh, you know, we, we increasingly help design these uh, sustainable platforms and ecosystems. So that, that's it uh, from me. I mean, it's, it's been a great pleasure bringing together uh, practitioners, entrepreneurs, policymakers, academics, investors once again. Uh, so thank you uh, to our panelists, uh, our speakers, our moderators. Uh, I'd like to thank, of course, also everybody who's been uh, instrumental in putting this event together. So Robin Boots, uh, Arthur Lotte, uh, Stephanie Talralson. Uh, I'm, I know I'm forgetting a few people. Louise Plantin, of course, who's been screaming in real time and capturing the essence of uh, the discussions uh, today. So thank you also for joining us today. Uh, thank you all, all the participants. Um, we've got more than a thousand people now, uh, member of the Platform Leaders community. I've seen many of you contributing to the to the chat today. Apologies if we couldn't uh, answer all the all the questions. Uh, but uh, thank you for, for being active. Um, and basically, I'd like to thank uh, our sponsors as well. Uh, we like to keep these events free. So I'd like to thank Google for supporting uh, this event today. So we look forward to seeing you uh, later on this year. And we've got great plans for platform leaders, some online, some offline. So you will, uh, you will hear more about this uh, in the weeks to come. So I'm going to leave you with the animated version of the illustrated summary uh, of Louis Plantin. Uh, and uh, that's all from me. Uh, I'll see you soon.